It's conventional uh, to give an introduction uh, at a moment like this, and there are, of course, two things that make doing that difficult, if not pointless, one of which is everybody already knows the speaker, and the other is his family is here, which means, of course, that introductions must be handled with particular care. Um, uh, I've been trying to talk about Snowden and the future at this law school this fall, and I was hampered by two things. I hadn't read the documents, uh, and I wasn't a cryptographic expert. So um, both of those problems have been solved because I'm not going to be doing the talking this evening. Uh, Bruce Schneier is, uh, I think, uh, it is fair to say, the world's most important cryptographer and public intellectual. Uh, most wonderful cryptographers being more introverted and less linguistically capable in my rhetorical <laughs> form. Uh, so that's why he doesn't need any introduction. Um, uh, but I should say, as another alumnus of the Hunter College Elementary School system, that Bruce is a graduate of the Hunter High School in New York, and of the University of Rochester, and of American University, and holds honorary doctorates arising from having done good work for the human race, which most people here know all about. Uh, applied cryptography is still a really good place to begin <coughs> if you want to understand why you can trust the math. Uh, and the uh, array of articles, interviews, and books on security and trust and modern technology is for people like me who try and follow along doing the law of this, uh, not just an inspiration, but a godsend. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to have Bruce here at Columbia today because he knows what the rest of all those documents say, uh, which means he knows a great deal about how Snowden and the future is really going to turn out. Uh, and I hope uh, in conversation here this evening we can hit some of the geeky high spots of all of that. So Bruce, welcome uh, to Columbia Law School and thank you for being here. Maybe a really good place to begin would be to say whatever you can say about how you came to be involved with Glenn Greenwald and the project of publication of Mr. Snowden's disclosures. And the, well, the one sentence answer is, uh, I was asked. <laughs> So uh, Green, Greenwald had his, in his possession all of these documents. Uh, they are very technical, they're very jargon filled, and he needs uh, an expert in the material to, uh, to help understand them. And, and my name came up again and again until he called me. And stuff happens and I, I, I go down to Rio and it, it's a kind of a surreal experience to, to be handed, you know, reams of, of top secret classified material and say, hey, read this and tell me what you think. But that's what I did. And uh, we, we, we worked we worked on several stories. The, the one story we published before uh, Greenwald uh, severed his relationship with The Guardian was about Tor. We met the anonymity service. Uh, how, uh, man, it, it's a good story. I mean, it talks about how, it's, how it is secure, how the NSA does go after Tor users, you know, what, what mechanisms they're using, and then the greater story of how they are attacking users on the internet, both getting data, breaking anonymity, breaking in, in, into computers. And the story published in early October, at, uh, I think it was like two weeks later that Greenwell broke with The Guardian, and presumably when the new venture gets started up, I, I will be you know, back doing, doing stories. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there is a lot more to tell. I mean, until then, you have, you're in the very capable hands of, uh, of Bart Gelman and Ashkan uh, Sultani, who are writing for the, uh, the Washington Post and doing, doing a great job. What, 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 what do you think um, we should do uh, it, with the fact that you probably weren't terribly surprised by what you read? Um, there's, a, there's a sort of uh, a, a, a meme around the world that says, well, nobody is really surprised because everybody knows it's going on, therefore there's nothing we need to do about it. And I find myself confronting that knowing that the first part of the <laughs> syllogism is in fact correct. We're not terribly surprised. Why are we not terribly surprised? You know, I, I think we're both surprised and not surprised. And it's really interesting. If you, if you ever 
and watched any movie with an NSA villain, this is exactly the sort of thing they would do. I mean, they, they, there's nothing in any of the revelations. I mean, sometimes they're a bit extreme, you know, spying on, on, on gaming worlds, but if you thought about it for half a minute, you'd say, well, of course you would. I mean, well, why wouldn't you? That's a place to communicate. And if the goal is to eavesdrop on all communications, you're going to eavesdrop on, on that channel, just like you'll eavesdrop on the little chat window in a Scrabble game, as, as well as, as Skype. So, I mean, there is no surprise, but the details, the extent, I, it, I think it really is a surprise that, that we, we kind of knew it, but we never actually fully thought about it. We never, we never did the math. We never worked out the budgets. Right? If you had, and we were starting to, because we were seeing the Utah facility come up, and people were looking at the square footage and the power, and you know, how many servers are there, and what could be stored there. But, but still, you know, you're just guessing. But seeing it for real, I mean, it's just surprising because it's there. You might know it's there, but seeing it. And, and the analogy I've been using, and it's a crummy analogy, but it's the best one I've got, that it's kind of like death. That you all, you all know death is coming. It's not a surprise. The story always ends this way. Yet every time it happens, it is a surprise. Because you basically never really think about it. And I think surveillance was, was like that. We never thought about it. There were, of course, a lot of professionals in the world of cybersecurity who had thought about it. They are more surprised, I think, than you and me because they trusted what the listeners told them more. The gaps that have opened up in the documents you've read between what is actually going on and what people were assured was going on must seem fairly large. We know that they promised the financial community they weren't going to try and break financial crypto. You know, we know they made all sorts of promises about how minimization worked in the United States. Uh, in that sense, is it true that, uh, th that those of us at the cypherpunk edge of the world are less surprised than the more respectable people because they trusted the listeners more? I, I don't know. I think, you know. My guess is if you're right, you're surprised even more because, my God, it is actually that bad. Uh, you know, I, I you know, it's, 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 I mean, around the edges, I mean, we, we sort of had a, a bell curve of, of beliefs of, of how bad this was, and, and now we're now we're seeing that, you know, even the more extreme beliefs of, of how much surveillance is going on uh, are true and actually conservative. Right? We we're seeing, I mean, a surprising number of, of alliances. That, that it's very common for the NSA to spy on country A and then partner with a, country A to spy on country B and then partner with country B to spy on somebody else. I and mean, we're seeing so many webs of that. So, so Germany, who's, who's one of you know, NSA's most trusted partners, is, is also being spied on. The only thing we haven't seen, and I'm, I mean, I can't wait because I think it'll be you know, extraordinarily big, is when we start seeing the UK and the US spying on each other which I think the odds of that not being true are very small. Because why in the world, if you as the NSA are spying on your own country, why wouldn't you spy on the country of your, your closest ally? You're spying on everybody else. It's, there's just no, just no exclusion. What do you think is the biggest headline for you as a, as a technical thinker that comes out of the documents you've seen? I think the most important headline is that crypto works. I mean, that, that we, we expected more cryptanalysis. We expected more, the NSA can break this code and that code and that code. I mean, we know they're spending an enormous amount of money on this. This is, this is what we're working on. But again and again, we learned from the documents that cryptography works, right? That's the lesson of Tor. The NSA can't break Tor and it pisses them off. Uh, that's the uh, lesson of, of the NSA's eavesdropping on your buddy lists and address books from your connections between your browser and uh, Gmail, your, your ISP. You look at the data, and they get about 10 times the amount of data from Yahoo users as Google users, even though Google's so many more times larger than, than Yahoo, it's because Google uses SSL client-side as default. So SSL works. And there, there's another slide from a program called Muscular, which is the NSA's program for getting your Google data from, the, from, the, from their data centers, from the uh, connections between them, where they specifically point out that this is the place where SSL is removed. So we see again and again that 
And, and they'll talk about that cryptography is not much of a barrier. But they're not breaking it by breaking the math. They're breaking it by cheating. They're breaking it by going after implementation, by, by stealing keys, by forging certificates, by doing all the non-cryptography things that we all know are important, but you don't get that, that, that mathematical benefit. Do, do, do you, just to take the, the, the paranoid side of this for a moment, how much of that do you think could turn out to be cognitive bias in our collecting? Did Mr. Snowden miss the whole other trove in which the documents about crypto breaking are? I mean, that's certainly possible. I mean, you know, we, we, we don't know a lot about how he collected and what he collected, but it's certainly possible there are documents about cryptanalysis that are completely separate on separate networks and have access to them, and, and we don't see them. Uh, but what we are seeing is operational stuff. And you'll see again in the, the, the documents on Bull Run, which is their program to subvert cryptography, it, it'll say in several places, uh, don't speculate on how this works. Right? I mean, you, you, you want, so you, you're talking to, to the analysts, the people doing the intelligence. Uh, you want to break into these circuits. Uh, we, will, we will do that for you. Don't speculate on how we're doing it. Just accept this windfall of data and, and be happy. Uh, but we do see, again and again, crypto stymieing. And the, the tour, is, the tour uh, story is really important. I mean, they have seminars and workshops on how do we break tour. And again and again, you see that they're unable to, that the cryptography is working, that when they have breaks, they're getting around. They're, they're around the edges. They're attacking the, the, the user. They're trying to go after uh, correlations. Uh, there is something that there's a, there's a, in, in the black budget, which we see the first pages of, and I think the Washington Post published those, uh, there's an, a narrative by, by, Andy, by, by Clapper, James Clapper, talking about uh, what the NSA is doing. And there is one sentence he talks about cryptography. I'm going to read the sentence because I think it's interesting. The wording is interesting. Uh, he says, we are investing in groundbreaking cryptographic projects. We are investing in groundbreaking cryptanalytic capabilities to defeat adversarial cryptography and exploit internet traffic. Okay, so that sentence doesn't sound like we got a bunch of smart people in a room and we're hoping they're going to get lucky. Right? That sounds like we've got a piece of math, but we need a bunch of engineering to make it work. Right? We need the really big computer. We need the huge database. We, we, need, we need something that requires just time and budget and not, not new math. So there's, there's speculation that there is at least one piece of cryptography that they have that we don't, which seems perfectly reasonable. Right, they, they tend to hire the top 10% of mathematicians every year. They go into, their, into the agency. They never come out. They get everything we do. We get nothing they do. I mean, right, there is going to be this differential in knowledge, which will expand over the years. You know, and, and before this, we, we all would say, you know, we think they're 10 years ahead of the state of the art. You know, and we pull that number you know, out, of, out of the air. So there are speculations of, of what the NSA has. And these are just speculation. We, we know nothing. And I, I sort of, I'll, give, I'll give the three. Uh, the first is, is something in elliptic curves. Elliptic curves is a very complex area of mathematics that is being used for public cryptography. And it is perfectly reasonable to believe that the NSA has some ability to either break elliptic curves to a greater extent we can or break certain classes of curves that we will not be able to recognize. We know the agency has tried to affect curve selection, which implies that there are some classes of curves they have an advantage over. I mean, we don't know. Uh, the other uh, I mean, reasonable assumption is general factoring. I mean, if you look at the academic world, factoring gets better slowly every year. A factor of two here, a factor of 10 there, a factor of 100 on a really good year. I mean, every year it progresses. If you assume the NSA is 10 years ahead of the state of the art, you can do some math and you could assume that they are at some higher point than we are. Right? And that'd be the sort of thing that would make sense from Clapper's quote. Uh, the third <coughs> speculation is the RC4 algorithm, which is, it's just a symmetric cipher 
that has been tottering on the edge of we can break it in academia for a, quite a while. Uh, invented by Ron Rivest, who is actually the master of the too good to be true cipher. Right? You can't imagine it being secure, yet you can't break it. And, 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 and maybe it's holding up, but maybe they have something. That's, those are my guesses, but there is going to be at least one piece of math. It will be extraordinarily hidden. I mean, just like the names of the companies who are cooperating in Bull Run, I mean, this stuff is, is ECI, extremely compartmented information. It's, it, it's you know, pretty much never written down. Now, sometimes you get lucky. And, and Snowden, you know, because of his position, did get lucky. I, I remember in some of the early weeks of this, it was some congressman who said, it's a quote like, Snowden couldn't have this data. Uh, you have to be on a list to get this data. He wasn't on the list. I'm listening to this person thinking, no, no, you don't understand. Here's the man who typed the list into the computer. <laughs> don't you understand what root access means? No, you don't. Right? Right? Who has the most access to the secrets in a company? It's the janitorial staff, right? Because they get access to everything. Right? The plumbers, the people who are doing the infrastructure have enormous access, and, and that seems to be what happened. So, so let's talk a little bit about the efforts against math. Uh, standards corruption, for example. We have clearly one documented case of NSA taking over a standards making process and choosing in the end for NIST uh, a random number generator which was uh, not a random number generator exactly. How far should we think that process of not necessarily attacking the basic mathematics but attacking how that math is applied in the standards process to, to produce uh, weaknesses, how far should we take that to have extended? I mean, that, that's certainly worry. It's something we're looking at a, a, over and over again. The standard in question is a random number generator standard. And actually, a, a, you know, if you are going to put a backdoor in a system, hacking the random number generator is a, is a perfect place to do it. Right? You can do it imperceptibly. Uh, it doesn't affect the output at all. It, it, you know, it, it's a really good place to put a, a secret backdoor. And this is a case where, and again, we knew, right? You know, it, it's what it was 06 or 07. I'm writing an essay saying, don't trust this random number generator because there could conceivably be a backdoor, and here's how you would put it in. So again, right, no surprise, big surprise. Uh, it's one of four random number generators in the standard. The other three we think we think are good. Uh, but you know, this, this, this entered the standard, and then it was started being requested by governments, by, by US government contracts. And it ended up as the default random number generator in some libraries, and no one's really sure how. So I mean, this is an example of how a hack standard can sort of infiltrate slowly the systems we're using. So now we're starting to look at everything else. And, and NIST, who's the government entity doing these standards, who pretty much has been trusted is coming under a lot of scrutiny. And they, I, I think, rightfully are very angry at, at the NSA for ruining their credibility. Uh, you know, I think a lot of the standards are still good. The, uh, the AES, I think, is still strong. We have a new hash function standard that I'm happy with. Then these were the semi-public processes. Right? These, these were not NSA-produced algorithms that became standards. These were open calls. And we in the community would look at them and there was like rough consensus in the end, and then NIST picked one. It's possible that, that they're hacked. I think it's really unlikely. Uh, I, would, I would more look at implementations. I mean, we know that uh, cell phone encryption. And, 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 this, and this is not just the NSA. Here you have an international cell phone standard, and you've got you know, three dozen countries want, want to eavesdrop. So altogether, there's, there's pressure not to have real security in, in, in your cell networks. So, so these are, are more overt. We, we, we know about them. Uh, I worry more about the private standards than the public standards. You know, the, the, we, we have one example of a backdoor trying to be slipped in, into Linux, which we are, are almost positive is enemy action. We don't know who the enemy is in this case. It, could, it really could be anybody. Uh, which, which we found, I think, because we got lucky. So certainly it is possible to slip back doors in commercial software. Uh, I worry less about the standards and more the private stuff we can't see. 
Do you think we're going to have to consider the possibility that the all the standardized families of ECC curves are ones that we should abandon? I don't. I mean, th there are curves that came from academia. There are curves that have come from public processes. And those are, are ones I think we can trust more. I, I would like to up our key lengths for, for extra conservativeness, just because I'm now more leery, especially in elliptic curves. So I think we just have to look at pedigree. And we have to, to, to mistrust things that can be tampered with. I mean, the fact, I mean, we know that the NSA has, has implemented curve selection. We really don't have, know how. But we don't know if it is the NSA going to, I'm making this up, you know, an engineer at some company and saying, here's some curves, why don't you suggest these? You know, we don't know. Or there's been some vetting. You know, we, we don't know what has happened. But I, I, I would like curves to be generated in open public manners. And I, I think for the world, if we're going to trust them in, in a global community, we, we have to do that. I mean, it's good to me. I mean, we, we end up talking about the NSA, but this, this is not about the NSA. I mean, this is what any large nation state would do. I mean, the Snowden has given us some, some phenomenal insight into the NSA's activities in particular, but we know China uses a lot of these same techniques. Right? We know other countries do. And, uh, you know, this is going to be what cybercrime looks like in three to five years because to, you know, technology democratizes. So, you know, we really need to get security for everyone against everything. So let's follow that uh, up a little bit. We have taught so far, and most of the Snowden documents that we have seen uh, publicly released so far have taught primarily about passive listening activity of one sort or another, hack, tap, steal, with respect to the backbones and the telecoms networks. But we haven't had much information uh, about listener activity directed at subverting the security of individuals or businesses. With the cookie-based material that started coming out 36 hours ago, things have begun to change a little bit about that. Have you seen things you can talk about that relate to how uh, the, 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 the American military listeners or others are directly subverting the security of individuals' computers? So, so the first story on that was the tour story from early October. And there, I mean, I, I, I wrote about two different programs that the NSA uses for, for active attack. And, and there's been a great article in, in Foreign Policy on, on TAU, that's Tailored Access Operations. This is basically the NSA's black bag teams. So we, we have seen these stories over the, la over the last several months. Uh, so the, the two things I wrote about in early October were Quantum. And Quantum is this is an add-on to their eavesdropping platforms. So NSA has large eavesdropping platforms on internet trucks. And these have names like tumult and turbulence and turmoil. And I'm not quite sure how those three relate to each other. They all begin with TU, so they seem to be a family. I think one is a superset of another. Turmoil seems to be the latest generation. And, and turmoil is the device that, that gets the fire hose and then quickly decides you know, what needs further analysis? Right? Because the fire hose is coming at you, you need to make very quick decisions about what to eavesdrop on. So, so sitting on turmoil is something called quantum. And what quantum does is it gives the NSA the ability to inject into the stream, right? to add bytes. And this is what the NSA uses for things like packet injection. A packet injection just injects packets into your data stream. Again, nothing new. This is how the Great Firewall of China works. Uh, this, this is a hacker tool. But if you're sitting on the, the, the backbone, if you're on the AT&T backbone, you can do some phenomenally interesting things with this. Now, you can uh, do uh, DNS hacking. This is actually what China does to, to, for uh, censorship. Uh, you can uh, do frame injection where you redirect users surreptitiously to, uh, to other servers, and I'll get back to that later. Uh, we knew from the tour story that uh, there's something called quantum cookie. That well, We didn't really know how it worked until we just got the, uh, the, the cookie story from a few days ago, but the slide said force users to divulge their cookies. Right, so this is a way that the NSA would, would and so I mean, think about this in, in terms of a Tor user. This is a user that's being anonymous, that's, that's anonymous on the network because of Tor. If you could force that user to divulge his cookies, well, if you've got a database of whose cookies belong to who, 
that de-anonymizes. Right? So, so now we're seeing how these things link together. And then there are other, there are other quantum programs. Nicholas Weaver, uh, who's at uh, UC Berkeley, knows nothing about the documents, but has written some great uh, essays on how this works, because this is how, of course, it would work now that you know about it. You start thinking about what you would do with this. So we do know, we do know quite a lot about quantum, and I think that's important. Uh, we also know about a program called Fox Asset. And, 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 and by the way, the NSA has the coolest code names in the world, right? <laughs> anyway, if you're at lunch, you want to sit at the Fox Asset table. That'd be neat. Uh, worst code name, egotistical giraffe. You never want to sit with them, ever. So Fox Acid is the NSA's multifaceted hacking tool. And if you sort of think about their problem, if you think about what they need to do, they need to turn basically people off the street into cyber warriors. And the way they do that is not going to be through years of training. That's expensive. It's going to be through, through tools and procedure manuals right? and, and sort of way, automate, automated, semi-ordered ways to, to make hacking work. And Fox Acid is, uh, if you know hacking tools, you know Metasploit. Fox, Fox Acid is a Metasploit with a budget, basically. Right? So, so this is the server that when you visit it and you can be, tem you can be forced to visit it in many ways. One of them is through a quantum, we think it's called a quantum tip, uh, uh, quantum insert. I mean, there, there are the, uh, some names, some codings we actually don't understand. That you're, that you're, the phrase they use is tipped. Tipped into Fox Acid. So you're visiting, I'm making this up, Google, and the NSA sees you visit Google, and they do a frame injection, and then some invisible packets go to, go to the Fox Asset server, which recognizes who you are through whatever systems they have, and they've got them, then the server says, okay, it's this person, and they're gonna know, is this person a uh, high value versus low value? Is this person a sophisticated user versus a naive user? And based on all of these uh, criteria, Fox Asset will decide what exploit to serve. Uh, and I forget the code name of, of, the, of, of the basic exploit. It's a cool code name too, damn it. Um, and then, then if that works, so that's called a shot. If that works, then there's a series of other exploits that are run to figure out, okay, I, I now have owned this computer. Who is it? Where is it? What network is it on? What's it connected to? What's on it? And, and then we know there's a lot of specialized attack tools. There was a a document that uh, the, the French uh, press published. And I don't know if they meant to, but at the bottom of this document was this glossary of code names and, and attack codes. And there was a special attack code for figuring out you know, where the geographic location is. A special attack code for jumping air gaps. That was interesting. The special attack code you know, for doing various things you might want to do. So we have quite a bit. We, we, we've seen nothing so far from U.S. Cyber Command, and uh, you know we don't know. I mean, it's not public yet if the story is not yet out, or if just the U.S. Cyber Command documents were separate enough that that they're not in the trove. So everything we're seeing is NSA and GCHQ, and that's that's the British counterpart. We are not seeing U.S. Cyber Command, which which presumably does a lot more offensive operations. That's kind of their job, but the NSA does does quite a lot too. Right, we know that uh, that Tau will go in and 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 steal keys. But if there's a circuit they want to eavesdrop on and they can't break it, they'll they'll go in and steal the key. Let's go, let, let, let's just uh, hang out a moment in this question of injection attacks from the backbone. Um, so that tip that that put somebody's browsing activity into a platform where they could try various exploits and see what was going on, that depended upon an injection, a frame injection in the example you gave, which a browser could be smart enough to turn down altogether. If that browser were running NoScript, what would happen? You know, it depends. A NoScript is a, is a really good way to, to deal with some of these, but, but in, our, in, our normal, in our normal browsing, there's, there's often quite a lot of redirects that don't all involve scripts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear to me whether scripts are required for this attack. I think there are going to be some attacks where they're not. 
but and, and you you read the uh, the NSA documentation, they actually talk a lot about what they call PSPs, personal security products, and these just piss them off ginormously. Right? That, that that a lot of this this action. I mean, it revolves around a couple of things. It revolves on the fact that the internet is, is very insecure, sort of out of the box. And there is this sort of background radiation of script kiddies attacking things all the time. Right? So when you are attacked, you know, it's the 30th time this millisecond, so what? And, and that, that will give an agency like the NSA or, or somebody else an enormous amount of cover because attacks happen so often. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's certainly a lot of things we can do to make this much. Right? Encrypting the backbone would, would do an enormous amount of good. Right? I mean, you can't do frame injection for in, a, in an SSL connection because you can't see the frames. I mean, you can, you can do a DNS redirect. There are other things you can do, but there are things you can't do. Uh, you know, using, t using the privacy tools we have, I think, give us an enormous benefit. I mean, the, the fact that Tor works, I mean, you know, that might be the biggest surprise we've seen so far. Right? That, that Tor does work. It's annoying to use, but it does work. I mean, that, that, that shows that a bunch of, of us can decide that we're going to build a privacy tool that will defeat major governments. That's kind of awesome. Kind of too awesome to be true. <laughs> I, you know, every, everything I've read tells me the NSA cannot break tour. I believe the NSA cannot break tour. When all the dust settles, how much are they not going to have been able to break? you think tour's going to be the exception, or are we going to be sitting there saying the new PG is also safe? I, I, think, I think most of the public domain privacy tools are going to be safe. Yes, I think a, a GPG is going to be safe. I think that OTR is going to be safe. I think that Tails is going to be safe. I mean, I do think that these systems, because they, they were not, the, you know, the NSA has a big lever when a tool is, is written closed source by a for-profit corporation. Right? That, that, that there are, are levers they have that they don't have in the, an open source international altruistic community. And, and these are generally written by crypto paranoids. They're, you know, they're they're they're, they're pretty, they're pretty well designed. And we, we we, you know, we make mistakes, but we find them and we correct them. And and, and we're getting we're we're getting good at that. Uh, I mean, I think if the NSA is going after these tools, they're going after implementations. Right? They're you know you know everyone got their Microsoft update patches uh, two days ago. You installed them. Did that put a backdoor in your system? You have no idea, right? I mean, we hope not, we think not, but we actually don't know, right? That's gonna be a much more fruitful avenue of attack. And yes, you can actually break all of those tools that way. You know, I mean, auto-update is great, but auto-update requires trust. So, but, but I, I think the math and the protocols are, are fundamentally secure. So, though I will admit that I say this as a free software advocate, I think what you just said is without freedom zero, there's no freedom. If you can't read it, you can't trust it. Is that where we're going to be when the dust settles? I mean, I think it's where we always have been, but fundamentally... But people didn't believe it. But, but, but we do believe it, right? I mean, we, we believe it. We, but, but, you know, we all believe it. We are all here trusting the building codes here at Columbia University, right? We, we trusted them. We don't think about, well, the roof could fall on our heads, but we are trusting that we so we're trusting the people around us we're trusting all the tools we use both tech and non-tech so yes we're trusting our, our hardware I mean right a few days ago it was it was an open BSD announced that they no longer trust the random number generator on the Intel chip not because this is not because we know it's broken not because we have evidence that it's broken because we know that Intel is susceptible and if they were told you know, break your random generator or not buying your stuff anymore. What are they going to do? And uh, a researcher whose name I forget right now showed a really clever way to put a backdoor in a hardware random hardware number generator on a silicon chip that we would never in a million years find. Right? So we have a proof of concept that it's possible. We have uh, a company that, that could be susceptible. And we have mathematical fixes to this. Right? We can run the hardware output 
through, a, uh, through an algorithm with some other input, and we know how to fix this. Right? So we either have to trust them or we have to you know, do things to ensure we're still secure even if they're not trustworthy, but we're still trusting those tools that are now fixing this. So you know, in the end, you have to trust everyone up the chain, from the hardware, operating system, software, user, be everything, to the room you're sitting in, which could have you know, various listening devices. And, and I don't think, I don't think that's never going to change. In any technological society, you cannot examine everything. You fundamentally must trust. Right? This is why transparency of process is so important. Right? We don't trust because we verify. We trust because we know someone else verified, or, or a few people who mutually don't like each other have verified. And that's the sort of mechanism. Right? Both, both Republicans and Democrats are counting the votes, therefore. I mean, that sort of thing. But in that, we would then say that the way that reduces out is use software over hardware where you can, and use software where you can read yes. over software that yes. you can't. And so we are pushing ourselves towards openness or freedom, depending upon which word we happen to prefer using. And we're basically saying hardware's definition in the 21st century is hardware's what the NSA is inside. Unless we have open source hardware, which, which, which we hear talk about. Well, but and at that point, we're going to have to go very far towards the chips themselves. That's right. We, right. So we're not talking about designs and layouts that are free to copy, modify and reuse. We're talking about we have to go from the masks up, otherwise we wouldn't trust it. Right, and then the goal here is to reduce your, reduce your, your trust footprint. Right? I mean, I, if I have to trust 30 companies, if I can trust five, that's better. Right? You know, or, if, or if I can figure out ways that I don't have to trust any one, but in order to break my security, that's the collusion of two of them. Right? I mean, the, the, these things make it harder for the attacker. Okay, good. So I've got a I've got an apartment full of gear, like many of the people in this room, and there's a lot of boxes in there. I think what I have learned from the documents I have seen so far, and what I think they tell me about the context of the listeners I've always known, maybe you agree with me about this, is if I'm going to start distrusting some box in my apartment, I should start with my router. Uh, I I would I I believe and and this story hasn't really been told I I, I think it will I'm you know, I'm not I'm not sure where the details are that the routers the the network devices are a much fru more fruitful avenue of attack than the end than than the computers and and I think we're just starting to see that uh, there have been a couple of stories in the past couple of weeks about uh, malware attacks against routers. The criminals are to notice this. But routers I mean, never get patched, basically. Right? They're running a four-year-old version of Linux. They got a bunch of binary blobs around them for various device drivers, and they never, ever get patched. Right? Even if the patch was issued, you would no, have no idea how to install it. Uh, the margins are very slim. The, the industry is, is not, doesn't, isn't really set up. For, uh, for security updates. They're always building the next thing. Uh, so at, at the very small level, I think we, when we are not even ignoring the NSA, that, that the, the next wave of cybercrime is going to come after these routers. We, we saw an attack against point of sales uh, systems recently. Uh, there was a, a botnet that took over a gazillion routers in Brazil recently. So I, I, mean, I think this, this is, an, this is a, a very much a, a danger for all of us. Uh, for the NSA, I think they've had better luck with the router companies. And I think this is very generational. Right? I mean, you sort of think about the history of the NSA and surveillance and, and cooperating with, with, with U.S. companies. Telcos have been cooperating with the NSA since the NSA came into existence. And, and my guess is this cooperation you know, sort of just carried through the Cold War and after. And you know, it's no big deal for level three or, or at t or any, or any telco company or executive or person to know, oh yeah, we give the NSA a copy, that's just what we do. A and that is a very different mentality than you'll get out of Google or Microsoft or Apple or companies coming out of, out of the computer space that don't have this history of, of, of cooperation and collusion. And I, I, the, the reactions you're getting from those companies is much more hostile 
I mean, what do you mean you're doing this to us? Not, oh yeah, we, we, kind, of, we kind of assume that and we'll give you a room if you just ask. Just, you know, don't, don't be a stranger. But isn't part of the outrage of Google and Facebook the result of the fact that they thought they had made deals as a result of which they weren't going to be troubled more? They really just feel that the, that the guys who they bought didn't stay bought, right? You know, I, I'm not sure it's deals. I mean, I mean, yes, I think it's a bit, bit rich for, for you know, CEO of Google to complain that the NSA is getting a copy of the data it stole from you fair and square. Um, <laughs> And, and, and certainly a lot of, of government surveillance piggybacks on corporate surveillance. I mean, the, the, the whole story about cookies I mean, it, is simply because these companies want to identify you on the internet. And the NSA just getting itself a copy. Uh, right, that press cookie at Google, that's really fingerprint all the browsers just in case we need all the browser fingerprints on Earth. And then, by God, that makes it easy to steal all the browser fingerprints. But, but these companies do have a huge PR problem. I mean, they did believe, I think, that the bulk of the NSA collection of their stuff came through the front door, came through national security letters, it came through subpoenas, came through warrants. And, and I mean, I, I don't know it, but I assume Google has a room full of lawyers that deal with the 30, 50 countries that serve it with, with subpoenas and whatever, whatever they're called in that country, whether they're legal or not. And I believe these companies did think that that was primarily what the NSA was doing. I don't think they realized that that is just a way to launder stuff they got surreptitiously previously. And, and, and I think an important, I mean, a really important moral is that this, the NSA surveillance is, is robust. It's robust legally, it's robust technically, it's robust politically. I can name three different ways the NSA has access to your Gmail under three different legal authorities. And, and, I, and I worry about you know, pending legislation in the United States that tends to focus on a particular program or a particular authority, you know, not realizing that they have backups and backups to backups. So I, mean, I, I, do, think that, I, I do think that Google was, was legitimately surprised at the extent that they were penetrating given that they were cooperating where they thought they had to. I mean, we're, we're giving you what you're asking for under these extraordinarily draconian laws. You mean you're getting it these other ways, plural, also? What do you guys, have money to burn? Yeah, we kind of do. And so the private data miners who also have money to burn, they're going to have to burn some making themselves more secure. People aren't going to use them. But we don't know. I mean, so, so, so here we're getting back to trust again. You are someone in some country somewhere, and you've learned that the NSA is getting a copy of everything, and Google has a press release saying, oh, we fixed that. Do you believe it? I sure don't. I, I, think, I think the companies have a serious problem right now, that, that the trust that, and this is, this is an internet problem. right? The internet used to be run on a basic US benign dictatorship under the assumption that the U.S. was generally behaving in the world's best interest. And I think that that trust is lost as a one-way function. Right? We, we generally believe that Google, yeah, they were reading your Gmail and serving you ads, but that was it. And now that the cat's out of the bag, I'm not sure there's a way for these companies to convince the world that yes, we've contained the problem. Yes, we only give the NSA the data when they ask us with secret requests, <laughs> right? which is the best, they'll, the best they'll ever be able to say. So I, mean, and I think this is why we're seeing these movements in Brazil and other countries to say, wait a second, now we want this data in our country, that there ex no longer exists these assurances you can give us. Because maybe we were all just deluding ourselves the past you know, bunch of years. And, and cloud computing is not going away for a whole bunch of other reasons. I, I, I see coming some internet balkanization, which I think is going to be very bad. Because I mean, a bunch of other countries are going to do way worse than we are. You know, and a lot of countries are using our actions to justify their own actions. You know, so if this is fixed, I don't think it's coming from the, from the companies. I think it's coming from the tech community. It's coming from the IETF. It's coming from the open source movement. It's, com it's coming from 
all the, all the non-commercial entities that are, are going to try to build security back in. Because right? you know, we will never be able to trust Google or Microsoft or Apple, any of these companies again. I, I just don't think that's going to happen. But most of the free communities that have been building crypto and security software, groups of hackers who, as you say, are knowledgeable and extremely well motivated, they probably would have said 10 years ago, look, we are making software that we think creates security. But if you're up against national means of intelligence, all bets are off. And now, if you're right about what we're going to be called upon to do, we're going to have to raise our game very substantially because what you've really said is, unless you're good against national means of intelligence, you're not good at all. You know, but it's, it's, it's actually better than that. I mean, one of the things we've learned about the NSA is that they might have you know, more employees doing surveillance than the rest of the planet combined and a bigger budget than the rest of the planet combined. They are not made of magic. Right? They are subject to the same laws of mathematics and physics and economics that, 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 that everyone else is. And, and what we've done is, is not... The problem is we've made surveillance too cheap. We've made bulk surveillance too cheap. Fundamentally, if the NSA or China or a dozen other countries I could name or you know a bunch of really good hackers want into your computer, they are in, period. We do not have the expertise anywhere on this planet to build that level of security. I mean, right now in the world, on computers, attack is much easier than defense. But that's not what I'm trying to, de to defend against. I'm trying to defend against bulk collection. And not that the, and, and, right, and this is what we object to, right? If, if the Snowden documents revealed the NSA spied on the Taliban in North Korea, no one would care, right? So the NSA spied on Belgium, or I guess that UK spied on Belgium, it was like Connecticut spying on Nebraska. <laughs> but that's the problem, and that's because it is easier to get everything than to target, right? The economics are all wrong. And fixing the economics is a much more tractable problem and something we can do. And it is not, so it's not you need to be secure against the NSA. You need to be secure against NSA bulk collection. And that's, that's an extremely important point. If you're the financial industry, however, you may actually need to be secure against NSA. Part of what is happening, it seems to me at the moment, and I'd be very interested to hear your view about this, is that we are also living in a world after the end of money where trust is all that sustains economic value. Bars of gold have been replaced by bit streams assigned by trusted parties. And signing is a cryptographic activity. The consequence of which is that if we are to have the economics you're talking about in a world where values are represented by digital entities signed by trusted parties using <laughs> algorithms we believe in, there is actually, at the end of the day, a requirement to provide a level of security in order to stave off chaotic risk in the world financial system, which it appears the American government has been deliberately undermining. Isn't there a, a, a really hard choice out there for us now about whether we're going to have security in the way the military listeners think about it, or we're going to have trust sufficient to run the world economic system. So I mean, I think this is this is the this is the fundamental choice that this this whole story brings to light. And, and, you know, and a lot of people talk about this as, you know, should the NSA be allowed to spy or not? And and that's actually the wrong way to think about it. The, the way to think about it is. Should we build an, uh, a, an internet, an electronic infrastructure, information age, uh, where everybody is allowed to spy or where nobody is? Right? I mean, do we choose surveillance or security? Where security is defined as not that the NSA is listening, that nobody is listening. Because right? the NSA doesn't get the only ear. And I mean, so it's, it is, it's, the, it's the global financial industry, but, but it, it's, it's everything else as well. You know, when, when, and, then, and this is in the NSA's mission, but the NSA's always had a dual mission, right? Throughout the Cold War, it's protect U.S. communications and eavesdrop on Warsaw Pact communications. 
And, and that dual mission made a, a lot of sense during the Cold War, right? You eavesdrop on the Soviet stuff and you protect the American stuff. That, that fails when everyone starts using the same stuff. Right? When the entire world uses TCP IP and Cisco routers and Microsoft Windows, suddenly, well, not the entire world. Well, you know, but, but, but enough, <laughs> enough of the world, to a first approximation, you now have a very real choice. Right? You, you, let's, you learn of, of a vulnerability against, I'm making this up, a Cisco router. You can use that vulnerability to eavesdrop on the people you don't like, knowing full well that other people might discover that vulnerability eavesdrop on you. Or you can close the vulnerability, reduce your ability to eavesdrop, and, and eliminate everyone else's ability to eavesdrop as well. And, I mean, and maybe the financial industry is the tipping point for this, but I think we need to collectively recognize that it is in our collective long-term interest to have actual security and not eavesdropping. Does actual security imply anonymity? Yes. And the extinction <laughs> of anonymity has been pretty much their goal all the way along, right? I mean, attribution is what they look for. Make it possible for us to attach an identity to every yes. action. And, and, and this is this is the metadata debate. I mean, by, when, they, when the first prison, when the the first stories about Verizon and, and uh, cell phone eavesdropping, one of the defenses was the president. The, the president said this was basically, "Don't worry, it's all metadata, right? No one's listening to your conversations." Uh, I think this is an extremely uh, I don't know what the word I want to use. It's, it's, disingenuous. Yes, disingenuous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, and it is. right Because metadata equals surveillance. And, and this is easy for you to, I mean, it's easy to, to understand this. So you imagine you hired a private detective to, to eavesdrop on somebody. And that detective would put a bug in their home, in their car, in their office, right? And you would get a, a report of their conversations, right? That's what the data is. If you ask that same detective to surveil somebody, you get a different report. Where he went, who he spoke to, what he purchased, what he read. That's all metadata. Right? So when the, when, when the president says, don't worry, it's just metadata, I hear, don't worry, you're all just under surveillance 24-7. Right? So, and, and breaking anonymity is part of that. Because it's one thing to know that this, this anonymous blob did these things, it's very different to attach a name to it, or if you can't do that continuity with other anonymous blobs, right? you, you attach a persistent pseudonym. And, and that, I mean, that's not just the goal of the NSA, right? that's the goal of, of Google. That's the goal of Facebook. Right? When, when Google Plus came up with a real names policy, basically it was, look, we need to market to you better. Right? We, we don't want anonymity on our, on our system. Right? When, when they're trying to tie your cell phone usage to your internet usage, to your real world usage, that's all about breaking anonymity. So it, it's, it's you know, for profit and for government. This is what's happening. So what is the sum of the economic thinking that lies behind the idea that we change the economics? It is obviously expensive to follow people. You gotta have a right. guy out there tailing people and she's gotta know how to not get seen. But Getting five billion cell phone location records a day, that's much simpler. So it's, it, you, uh, they, isn't it a permanent economic fact of the way we live in the digital universe? Following individual people is expensive. Following everybody is much cheaper. Only if following everybody is cheap. Right? It, that's true because we have designed the cell phone system such that this location data is transmitted in the clear and easy to eavesdrop on. I mean, we could design a cell phone system that doesn't have that property. I mean, we've designed an internet economic architecture, right, where surveillance is the fundamental business model. I mean, we could decide not to design it that yes, way. Yes, but if you and I and everybody in this room who totally believes this goes and says we need to design an internet with anonymity built in from the beginning, it will be a complete political non-starter. Because every policeman, every taxman, every other form of legitimate government agency on earth has now decided that they can do a much better job governing us without anonymity and they're never going back. Isn't that right? So I am more opt I tend to be long term optimistic. 
I mean, I, I think that we as a species tend to solve these problems. It might take us a generation or two. We might have some pretty horrible world wars while we're doing it. But, you know, the, the, the quote that actually lets me sleep at night is, is Martin Luther King Jr. who says the arc of history is long but it bends towards justice. Right? We do manage to have more freedom and more liberty and more rights century by century, not year by year. So I do think that, that long term, wherever that is, we will have licked this. Okay, but Martin Luther King can say that because his view of justice isn't path dependent. His view of justice is that it's absolute and it's always there. Technology, on the other hand, is path dependent. So when our friend Dan Gear at InQtel says in that talk on trade-offs in cybersecurity that you and I both so admire, this is the last generation in which the human race gets a choice. He's basically speaking to what you've just said. You've said if we have long enough, we'll get this fixed. And he said technology is path dependent and once this is fastened on the human race, it may not be unfastenable again. And we evolve forward from where we are in a dependent path. So one of those lets me sleep and the other one keeps me awake. And between those two, what you and I have to confront is our friends out in the world who say it's hopeless, there's nothing we can do. And I'm not doing anything wrong, so why should I care? And those are the two arguments that we need to address. And so in the couple of minutes left to us before we open it up to all these people, what do you say to the people who say, it's hopeless, there's nothing we can do? So I think there's a lot we can do. I think, I mean, that's, I think, one of the most important morals from the Snowden documents, is that the NSA isn't made of magic, that they're not breaking cryptography to anywhere near the extent that we kind of thought they were, that there are things we can do to make ourselves much more secure. I mean, if you are the one person they want, but they're, they're going to get in, but again, that leverages the economics. That we're getting into tailing everybody individually. Right? You've only got so many agents, you only tail so many people. If you, if you eliminate the bulk or make the bulk harder or make us more able to hide in the noise, we are doing ourselves an enormous favor. And if we give the tools to the dissidents around the world who are hiding from much worse regimes than we have to do this, we are doing an enormous amount of good for the world. That there are things we can do. It is nowhere near hopeless. And I think we learn this again and again and again. And, and, and the, the other half is, is you know, why do I, what do I have anything to hide? I mean, the, the people who are speaking best to this are the psychologists who look at what it is like to live under constant gaze or under the threat of constant that if you believe that you could be watched at any moment what does that do to you as a person and, and what we learn is that it makes you different it makes you more conformist it makes you uh, less willing to think new thoughts try new ideas it stagnates society it makes us all worse right? society improves because People dare to think the unthinkable, and then after 20, 30 years, everyone says, well, you know, that was kind of a good idea. Right? It takes a while, but it has to start with doing something that you, that you don't want anyone else to know. Right? So, so it, it hurts us big and small. It hurts us in the big, and it, it, society stagnates, and it hurts us in the small is that we are diminished as individuals because we cannot fully be individuals. We have to be a member of the group. And, and there's, I mean, there's phenomenal writings, uh, you know, philosophical and psychological, that really look at, at how this works. It, it's a hard argument to make. I mean, the, the, the argument on the other side is, is quite simple. Terrorists will kill your children. That's it. <laughs> right? And that argument pushes like four very core buttons that will make you scared, right? But, and, and so if I can, I can spend an hour saying, well, this doesn't protect you from terrorism. That argument is happening at a higher intellectual level than your fear. I mean, I, I'm going to lose that argument. It, it, so we, we are, we're, the, the forces of surveillance are strong. It, this is extre it's an extremely difficult fight. and, and, and uh, I, I'm always amazed at the resilience of our species to, to overcome 
intractable problems to, to, to overcome futility. I, it always it, it amazes me again and again, and, and I'm not willing to count us out. I mean, it is possible we have reached some theoretical limit here. You know, and I can I, I can actually draw out that argument that's you know some Darwinian level limit in our species or that technology just just makes bad things happen, and we have no choice here. My guess is not, but it's going to require a lot of changing, right? I mean, the war has to end. And that was a phrase you used when we were talking earlier. I mean, if, if terrorists, could, if, if General Alexander could get in front of Congress and say, if I had these powers, I could have stopped 9-11. And no one looks at him and says, you didn't stop Boston. And that was with one guy on the terrorist watch list, the other guy with a sloppy Facebook trail. What are you talking about? Right? I mean, you, you need that level of, of of response, but I'm 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 still bullish on us. <laughs> so, if I don't ask you, somebody else is going to ask you. I might as well save the time. What are you using these days? Uh. Uh. <laughs> so, I mean, I actually wrote an essay about that in uh, in, in the Guardian, and uh, I, what do I trust? I, tr I trust OTR. I trust Tails. I trust GPG. I trust. Uh, Oh, I'm kind of, uh, for file encrypt, for uh, encrypt. true true crypt, which I consider the best of three bad alternatives. Uh, I do a few other things. I, there's a file erasure program that I think they're all pretty good. I mean, but basically, I I, I have an air gap computer I use for things that are on the internet. And again, I mean, all of these things we can pick apart, but I'm and I'm just trying to uh, to to make it harder. We, I mean, don't, I, it, we don't have to pick you apart because other people are doing uh, it. Right. <laughs> right, I mean, I, I, if the NSA wanted me, I, I think they're in. If the FBI, I mean, could the FBI get a, get a warrant against my computer? Probably. Right, they haven't broken down my door yet. That you know of. That I know of, right, you know. <laughs> but you know, I mean, right? But what am I going to do? I mean, maybe, maybe, but I, I, am, I, I am not a nation state. I cannot protect my computer. I mean, I, my, my house is not Tempest Shielded, and it will never be Tempest Shielded. Right? I will never have my, my computers in a, a secret level Mosler safe. I will never have guards. You know, no one's home right now. They're not home for a couple of hours. Right? I mean, so it is quite easy to grab an image of my hard drive. It is trivial to put a Tempest receiver around or, or grab my keystrokes when I type in my password. I mean, if you are targeted, there's pretty much nothing you can do, right, with that level. So, you know, at some point you have to just say that's the way the world works, uh, and, and, and you can't do anything. But you can protect yourself against bulk surveillance, and that's largely what I'm trying to do. I mean, I go in, when I go in and out of the country now, my security is don't have it on your laptop. Right? So when my laptop, and it's, it's interesting, I spend a lot of time now when I'm flying into the US erasing all my, you know, my free space and deleting data, and encrypting archives, doing all sorts of things, and you spend a few hours doing it, and then you go through the US border and nothing happens, you, you are pissed off. <laughs> I went through all this trouble and you can't seize my laptop? What the hell are you guys doing? Right? And, and, and I just know that after four or five times, I'm gonna say, well, I don't have to do this, right? They're not gonna take my stuff, and then they're gonna take it. <laughs> And security is a lot like that. And, and, and when you, I mean, that's an essay I really, I should write on how hard it is to get OPSEC right. And there's a nice story of the, uh, well, there's a couple of stories. There's a story of General Petraeus and how, how his, his, uh, his, his secret com conversations were he's dropped on. And also the, uh, the guy who was running Silk Road. And, and, and there's also a third one I would use from uh, uh, one of the, the Chinese hackers that Mandy had found. That it, you know, it's very, you have to be perfect. That if you make a mistake sometime in the past 10 years, your security has been compromised. And because there's never feedback, right? You never know. I, mean, I, I can tell you that one time, I, I, mean, I should say this, I spent a lot of time encrypting this archive. I had encrypted and I, oh, I, I zipped it, and then I encrypted it, and I decrypted it, and encrypted it again, make sure I had it right, because it's you know you get it wrong, the key doesn't work, and you're screwed. I, I do this, and I I, I throw the uh, the zips in the trash, I delete the trash, I erase the trash, I go through the border, I come in, open my computer, and I forgot to erase the originals. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
you never get any feedback as you do this. You never know if you did it right. And it's easy to make a mistake, because security is always, you never want to do security. It's always in the way. Oh, I have to remember when I use OTR to do the authentication step. Right? And it's, it's, it's not what I want to do. I want to talk to the guy. Right? I have to remember, and I'll do this. I'll, I'll close my laptop, boot it down, put in my USB stick, open up Tails, get it all ready. Oh, damn, the email address I wanted you know, is, is, on, is on the memory. I've got to close it all down, open it up again. Right? It, it's always in the way. So it's very easy to make a mistake. And, and the, the, uh, the way the balance goes, if you make a mistake, you're done. <laughs> This makes it very hard. I'm not helping, am I? I, I, I felt very good. I was thinking to myself, I just need to design an exploit platform that gives positive reinforcement back to you for doing the wrong thing. And pretty soon we'll have you trained to do the wrong thing. And, and it, get, it gets a cool code name and you're in. Absolutely. Uh, so, so I think it's time we let some other people ask some questions. Um, Hi, Bruce, thanks very much. Um, I wanted to ask one question that's sort of about the opposite side of bulk um, analysis, and that is um, about natural language processing. What is your assessment of the state of it, and how much of a threat and a problem do you think it really is? Because I've seen some of what's going into it, and I wasn't particularly impressed, frankly. Yeah, we, we don't know. Uh, there are a, a large number of patents the NSA has in this area. So there's, st there's stuff in public. Uh, my guess is they're extraordinarily good. I mean, this is something they've been working on since computers were invented. Because right, this has been a this is not a new problem, especially when you were dealing with radio, where where, where you had to transcribe. This is the only thing you could do. That, that that the recording just wasn't just couldn't keep up. So my guess is they're very good at 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 natural language uh, processing and natural language translation. Uh, you know, I I would expect that that most everything gets very quickly turned into text. Uh, that there's easy ways to annotate, you know, little bits of voice and stuff you don't know that might need a person. Uh, that that voice printing is extremely uh, advanced as well. And again, nothing has been published in this, and I don't know if it will be. But but I would expect this is an area they have devoted considerable resources on for decades. Are they better than Facebook? Do you think or Google? Uh, they would have to be. They have they've been doing this for decades and with way more budget. And again, it's going to be a one-way function. Anything that Google and Facebook can do is going to come out of the academic community, and they're going to know about. Mm -hmm. So it's like cryptography. You have this, you have this the information only flows in one direction, from the academic community into the NSA. It never flows the other way. So the NSA can get the best of the world plus what they have. Right? I mean, they, they, they spend a lot of money on, ling on linguists. Hi, Bruce. I want to get your opinion about uh, these third-party companies that are creating these commercial <coughs> off-the-shelf products in order to uh, spy on uh, target people. Um, I read this document, Water Eyes Only, Commercialization of Digital uh, Spying. And I think that at some point you posted something like that on your blog, so I want to get your opinion about these companies, not only NSA, but now these right. other people. Right. I mean, one of the things, I mean, I think one of the, I guess it is a problem that, that a lot of, a, a lot of, of things that go, not just, I mean, a lot of government capabilities have corporate analogs. I mean, so we've talked a lot about surveillance, that there's government surveillance, and then there's corporate surveillance, and all of these tools are being built for corporate surveillance, some of, some of it for legitimate reasons, right? Some of it for, for, for reasons we might not like, but, and then this is also being used for, by governments. Uh, you know, propaganda tools. You know, we were seeing uh, companies like, like Blue Coat and, and Sophos. I mean, these are commercial products sold in corporations that are also being sold, you know, to Syria to identify and arrest dissidents. That a lot of these technologies are dual use. And, and I don't think we can address one issue without also addressing the other. They, 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 that, that we cannot just say governments can't do this and corporations can. That, that the tools lend themselves to abuse. And, and you know, and there, there's talk about, about putting a lot of these tools back under export control. You know, over the past month, I've been seeing more discussion about that. You know, I'm not sure it's possible anymore. It's, very, it's a very different world in the 90s when you could actually could 
uh, had export controls on cryptography. Because there wasn't, everything was mailed around. It wasn't just downloaded. You know, the connected international world is much harder. You, you end up putting national barriers like the Great Firewall of China, which you know, it, it is, works well, but is also pretty porous. So I, mean, I, I think these are, these, are imp these are certainly important to talk about, that they're the corporate analogs to these government tools. I, I can't speak about the Snowden documents, which Bruce has seen, and we're not ready at SFLC to make any publications yet, but I can tell you for sure that there are national governments that have outsourced the process of penetrating and listening to computer networks to commercial organizations whose contract work mixes government and commercial spying, but whose primary bread and butter in this and other countries around the world is the conduct of government and spying. I, mean, I think it's dangerous for us because now you have an industry that is going to lobby. I mean, just like you have a private prison industry lobbying for more draconian laws, you're going to have a private surveillance industry lobbying for more surveillance because more surveillance means, means more sales. But wealthy database making companies <laughs> can be counted upon to do that anyway, Indeed. I should think. Um, uh, Ian, you uh, take it to the back and get some people. Here's a real uh, paradigm question for you. Uh, an important uh, strategy in all espionage is the spread of disinformation. Is it possible that with the Snowden documents or other types of leaks, uh, that there is some tiny bit of disinformation there to make the community represented here trust some type of technology that has actually been uh, is actually vulnerable? So that is actually the. Uh the less paranoid version of that argument, the more paranoid <laughs> one is, is that Snowden's a government plant and this is all disinformation. I mean, they, you, you do hear that. Uh, I believe that is not true. I believe that Snowden is a legitimate whistleblower, that he has legitimate whistleblowing documents that he did, I guess legitimately, that, 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 right, that he fair and square stole from the NSA and went to China with. And, <laughs> And that this is real, that this, this is not government disinformation. Uh, it would, no, nah, it, nah, it, it doesn't even pass the smell test. I, I, I do not believe so. Uh, it looks like we should hand the mic down. Just throw it at them. If we owned it, we would do that. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Uh, hi, so I had a question about uh, the relationship between corporate and government surveillance. Um, so, sorry. There you are, thank you. Um, so, um, so you were saying that one thing we could do to defend against the surveillance of the mobile phone network is that the location information could all be encrypted. But the mobile phone companies actually need to know which cell tower to send your signal to. Right. So the, so the mobile phone companies are going to know. So if they're, if they're in a position where they can't help but collude, do you have a, do you have, do you have a vision for what a mobile phone, a function, what people here would consider to be a functional mobile phone network would look like that the government couldn't actually inspire? So I, I don't know. My guess is it is possible that you could do have a distributed system that would hide location data from the central, the central nodes. And some of it is just, you know, leveraging <coughs> a small distribute, distribution, right? I, mean, I think we were all much secure when there were 100,000 ISPs than when there were 100. Right? I, mean, I mean, that level of, of distribution, again, we'll, we, it, it, the economics. We could force, force the NSA or the FBI to go after all of these companies rather than just a few. So, so my guess is, is there is a, a, a cell architecture that doesn't require centralized coordination. I mean, just like in, in, in file sharing, right, the original file sharing systems had a centralized network that knew who had what file. Those were gone after by the music industry. And then the follow-on systems were distributed. They were peer-to-peer. -peer. They didn't have that centralized command and control. Right? We, 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 we know how to do this. Question is making it fast, making it scale. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy. But if we wanted to, yes, I think we can. Do you know anyone who's working on that? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, guys. Uh, two quick ones, maybe one for everyone. Um, one is it worth it to encrypt in a big corporate cloud like Amazon or Rock, Rackspace using their encryption? Uh, and then two, what are the thoughts on Sybil Edmonds and Russ Tice and Cryptome who just were in a debate with Greenwald on Twitter? It's pretty, uh, it's pretty I didn't follow the debate. Nor I. Tell us about it. Well, basically, 
So Sybil Edmonds, who's the FBI whistleblower translator pre-9-11, she's saying, wondering, well, where are all the documents? Why are only 1% out, and what's going on with PayPal and Omidar and that? I think it turns out that starting a, a new media empire is harder than you think. <laughs> That's my guess, right? I mean, I, it, it's just things are happening slower than, than, than maybe people would like. You know, releasing documents is hard. I mean, there are legitimate secrets in there that you actually don't want released. There, there are. They, they really are. And, uh, and, and it's good that the process is happening slowly and methodically. That, that a, a, a WikiLeaks style data dump would not be fun for anybody. So, so that's good. Right? And there's a lot there and it's, it's slow to look at. And, and all of these stories do end up with a negotiation with the government. We're, we're, and, and this is where the way journalism works. The, 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 I, mean, I didn't know this, but, but I sort of you know, got to meet it, that the, the, you know, the reporters say, you know, we're releasing this story. I mean, do you have anything that, do you, basically, do you mind? And if the government says, yes, don't release anything, of course, no one's gonna listen, but if they say, look, this particular sense, right, if you do this, it will disrupt, you know, and, 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 and there's, there's a level of trust here between, between the reporters and the government, and, and you know, I mean, names are redacted, operational details are redacted. You know, if the NSA is spying on North Korea and the Taliban, we're not going to hear about it because that'd be a good thing. I mean, so, so there, are, there is this long process, and figuring out what are stories in in legitimate interest is is also a long process. So, so this this does take a long time. There's a lot of stuff. People are also making a lot of money though. That's that's kind of what's being conjectured. I don't, you know, the, the people who are doing it kind of. You know, are they? Is anybody reading this stuff except us? <laughs> Sorry. Isn't Greenwell getting? Greenwell does have a book deal, uh, you know, but uh, there's way easier ways to make a living than living in exile. I mean, I mean, Laura. Po I mean, none of these people are making lots of money. Laura Poitras. Uh, you think of uh, you know Barton Gelman for the Washington Post and Ashkan Sultani, who's working with him. Uh, this, this, this is not a huge profit center. You would do way, way better calling up the Russian embassy and saying, how much would you give me for the lot? Mm. <laughs> uh, I actually wanted to push back a little bit harder on that. Uh, you drew a dichotomy um, between, on one hand, surveillance, and on the other hand, uh, security. Mm -hmm. And you said that we have to choose among them, and among them, you choose security. Uh, and when you say that there are legitimate uh, secrets and there are operational uh, details, those operational details um, are things that we would need in order to defend against this stuff. And if I have, for instance, a friend who is working on anti um, censorship software um, or on uh, secrecy software, why don't you not give my friend a copy of these documents uh, so that my friend can actually make his or her software work? So the, so the hope is that the documents your friend gets are enough. That what's eliminated is the name and the phone number of the guy who wrote the document, right? Or, or what's eliminated, you'll see this in some of the documents, it'll give a list of you know, places where eavesdropping dropping on and the, uh, the IP addresses will, will be blacked out, right? So, so, I mean, my hope is, I mean, when, when, I, when I wrote the Tor story, I wanted to give enough detail so the people who, who derived Tor so the people who are working on internet backbone security had enough to figure out what the NSA is doing and then to defend themselves. Right? I didn't. I didn't need to tell them. And again, I'm making this up. That you know, that that Fox Acid was implemented successfully against you know these to these guys in Yemen, because because that is not useful to the fixtures. I, I try very hard. And, and I think the, the Washington Post as well. I, mean, I really am very happy with their level of detail. That it, it is enough for us to know what the vulnerabilities are, what the capabilities are, how they're being used, the extent they're being used, and to give us the information we need that if we chose to, to fix them. So, I mean, yes, I, I think this is, I think it, in some ways it would be neat to sort of say here, here it all is, it's, it's not gonna happen. It just isn't. If it, if it does, it will be a, it will be a mistake. I mean, like the WikiLeaks. I mean, it would be some some confluence of bad things that that you know that that shouldn't have happened. 
It's a little like ordinary vulnerability disclosure, isn't it, Dave? I mean, you might very well want to tell people how to fix the problem without explaining which bank is vulnerable, right? <laughs> Well, so at a certain point, if the problems aren't getting fixed, and it seems like on a political level, the problems are not getting fixed, because this is the other piece of it, our ability to advocate for ourselves as citizens about what policies we do and do not want, right? If the vulnerability is not being fixed, then at a certain point, you do go public and say, this is the vulnerability. Well, I think Mr. Snowden has done that, and I think the likelihood that politics won't fix this is probably 1.0, no matter how many documents are disclosed. <laughs> I don't true. think politics is going to do it all by itself, no matter what happens, precisely because I don't think it's really going to turn out that the politics hinges on the technical details. It hinges, it seems to me, where Bruce says it hinges on whether people are going to buy arguments that they should be afraid. And we don't know how mad democracy is about that yet. Thanks to Mr. Snowden, we're about to find out. I uh, just want to ask a slightly more technical question. So you mentioned um, basically that open source systems are uh, better in this case because we can look at them and see there's no backdoor. And what immediately comes to mind for me is the uh, underhanded C coding contracts or the, uh, the trusting trust attack. These things that you can hide backdoors in systems that people are looking at. Uh, do you have any ideas on how to defend against that sort of thing, make systems more audible, et cetera? So you can, but it's harder. Right, and, and, and so the reason I like open source and, and free software and non-corporate is less because you can look at it and more because it is harder for someone to slip something in, right, in that someone is looking at it. And yes, there's an obfuscated C contest. If you showed up in the Unix kernel with C code that looked like came from the obfuscated <laughs> C contest, you'd be sent back and told to make it more clear. Well, right? Have you looked at OpenSSL recently? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, it, 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 right, I, I'm just trying to leverage the economics here. I want to make it harder. I want to increase the risk. Something that comes up again and again in the NSA documents is they are amazingly risk averse. They, they, they don't like risk. They don't want to take risks. They really take very safe paths. And if you increase the risk, you're going you're gonna to tip it to a point where they're not going to try. Because the risk is, is, is dangerous. And, and I think that's, the, I mean, this is something that without any legislation, without any technical fixes, will change because, because of, 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 of this summer, all these stories. That it, amazing as it is that the NSA, which has all sorts of contingencies for all sorts of things, never had a contingency for, all of our documents get released to the public. <laughs> <laughs> right? It took them, what, two, three months to get a PR firm with a good enough clearance to talk to. Right? And now they have a blog and a Twitter feed and they respond quickly, but it took them a long time. So when they were making decisions like, you know, should we eavesdrop on Belgium? Right? I mean, they had all of these benefits and costs and risks, but the world finding out, sort of, they never thought that that was a possibility. Well, that is now over. That I think that basically every NSA operation from now on is going to be the big red letters underneath the should we do it or not. This will become public in three to five years with high probability. Are we okay with doing it? Right? And then it's going to, you know, and I think some things are just not going to happen. Because the, blow, the blowback has been, has been real. So you don't think like a trusting trust attack, a compiler? Uh, it, it, it could, but you know, that's not an easy attack. And, and it was discovered. And it was discovered, it's you know, like, wow. Right? So I mean, suddenly it's really bad. And, and I, this, has, this has rocked the agency. I mean, this, 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 is not, this is not something they thought of. But if I could just ask a technical question back, did I hear you say that it would be a really good idea if OpenSSL were rewritten <laughs> clearer and more modular and easier for people? Absolutely. Yeah. If you could rewrite the whole thing in Python, that would be. I, I, don't think, I, don't think we should, I don't think we should necessarily expect it to get rewritten in Python. I, and, and I personally am not so sorry about that. But, I'm, but I'll hold out for rewriting it all in Perl if that'll make it. <laughs> Uh, looking for practical judgment here on something that's actually an issue. At Wicked in Dubai last year, which was setting the ITU treaty, one of the suggestions that was strongly supported by the Africans, Egypt in particular, is that they wanted the right 
to request how packets would come to them. I.e., if something was coming from France, they might want it to go through North Africa because they thought Italy was compromised by the U.S. And we shut that down. We shut down all the security issues there totally. But is that one worth fighting for? Would that make it considerably harder if you could control the path coming to you? So it's worth thinking about. Right, you know, because we, we we're now seeing these 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 BGP these border gateway protocol attacks where where traffic is being shunted to particular places, happening more. Right, we know that right, traffic went to the Ukraine and Iceland for a while for for a reason nobody understands, but presumably somebody wanted that. Uh, so yes, I I think this technique will, is I mean not just governments is going to be a criminal technique that getting data to a place you can eavesdrop. Is, is going to be used more and more. And I don't know if, if allowing the sender or recipient to specify the routing, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think we need to shore up routing so it cannot be gained. And you know, I, I think it's going to be said to, for you know, route this not through the US. That, that, I mean, it, it actually really did surprise Brazil that getting the internet from Florida. I mean, I mean, it was OK until you realized that Florida got a copy. <laughs> but, but we do need to start thinking about routing a lot because there, there, there are attacks that are possible that are happening at not, I mean, not just government, but also, at also at lower levels as well. We've probably got time for about three more questions that people uh, have I, I queued up for. Um, sure. you, you already partially answered the question uh, that I had, but what, so let me slightly rephrase it. What else do we know about the BGP hacking that's been going on? Can you, um, well, what else do we know about this? There is nothing, there's nothing public from the NSA documents about them that we, that we know. <laughs> Hola, so I have a question. There, there's something that you said that I think could be misunderstood or could be problematic. The issue against uh, one that you have to do to defend yourself from a powerful adversary. And uh, I work on human rights, so I think it's particularly dangerous for those that are all the time the target of attacks that are state sponsored. So you said something uh, that sounds like, you know, if you are, you know, if the NSA, the ABI, the Chinese, the SNS wants your data, you're kind of screwed. Right? And I think that you may be right in a point, but I think. This could be misunderstood as all efforts are all efforts are futile. Yes. And so I would like to ask you for precision in that sense. My understanding is that in the context of this need for uh, to take advantage of the economic issue, is that we need to do the best we can, not just because of ethical issues, because we deal with you know critical people in critical situations, and we have the responsibility to protect and do no harm. But also because we need to do the best of our abilities. So even if they're able to break PGP, for example, or say we should still be. Using I mean, and again, I agree because again, this is the economics, right? I mean, they if they can do something, maybe they can only we can make it they can do two instead of five, or you know, two instead of a thousand, or ten instead of you know, ten thousand. That that we can make it harder, we can make it more expensive, we can make it more risky. And yes, every time we do something to increase one of those dimensions, we are making ourselves safer. Right? The the, the NSA does have a very privileged position on the internet because of who they are. Right? Many countries do not have their capabilities and cannot hack to that degree. So, I mean, so there are tools we're deploying in, in, in countries all over the world that are keeping people alive. I mean, Tor is one of them. Right? I mean, Tor saves lives. And, and so, yes, I mean, I, 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 we do need to fight that. And I see futility a lot when I talk to people in human rights in different countries. And I think that's very important to fight. That not only should we do what we can, but it is worthwhile that we do make ourselves safer. And every time you use Tor, one of you people who uses Tor, provides cover for everyone else who needs Tor to stay alive. All right, so I agree that that's, a, that that's an add to precision, which is important at the top end of the curve. But we also have to be fairly precise at the bottom end of the curve. If we are letting people use Windows computers or iPhones, then 
we are guaranteeing them no security and no secrecy, and we have to be pretty clear about that too. If you are using Apple products, if you are using Microsoft software, then if they want you, they don't have to be the NSA to get you. They could be a 12-year-old in St. Petersburg or a Peruvian <laughs> secret policeman, and they're in. So part of what we're going to have to tell people is, it isn't hopeless at all, but don't think that that means that you can be safe using the jewelry that everybody else around you carries. And that's going to be a harder lesson to get people to accept than that at the top end, we may not be able to do everything, but we have to make it as hard as possible for them. So we have to nail both ends of those curves to the axes. It is true that at the hard end, what he wants to use and what I want to use and what you want to use is worth doing because we're making it harder for them and there's human dignity in that. And because, as Bruce says, every time we do that we give a little more cover to other people, but we're also going to have to be fairly uncompromising about telling people what they must not use and what they have to throw away. And that's a harder sell than the other part of the story. It's, no, I mean, and, and it's getting worse, right? I mean, the new platforms have much more vendor control. I mean, the, 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 the I, and I, and I think the computer companies, the operating companies have realized they gave away a huge amount of revenue by making an operating system, letting anybody put whatever they wanted on it. So we're seeing uh, the, uh, the iOS for the iPhones. Microsoft Windows 8 is sort of moving in that direction of, of a centrally controlled ecosystem, making it much harder to have any security that's not authorized by the company who's providing your, your device. I can't even write a file erasure program for the iPhone. I don't have access to the memory. I mean, it's something that basic you can't do. You have, you have, a, you have a device that, I mean, you have no control of security. It, it is what you get. Right? In a computer, you have more control, and, but that's disappearing. So, like it said on a shirt I saw somewhere, free software, free society. <laughs> and actually, and this is the really harder part to tell people, but they gotta know it, unfree software, unfree society. <laughs> Thank you all very much.